previously we machined a new pulley to replace the one I messed up, then we pressed these bearings straight and then we started to assemble the rear axle. And coming up in this episode we'll get the diff housing finished off, get the rear axle mounted, get the motor mounted, finish off some machining on the wheels and get those mounted up. Welcome to episode 9. So in terms of things that have been happening while you've been away, um, I've got a new belt on here. So the last belt was 450mm long and because I'd made a slightly smaller pulley, um, I ordered a 400mm long belt. Uh, again it's 5mm pitch and you can see that fits nicely now. Uh, other things are the motor itself um, mounts very nicely on the plate now. If you remember before, uh, the mounting plate was very bent and twisted. So with a careful combination of uh, brute force, vice, a range of tools and taking a bit of care about it because it is very close to the uh, the cables and close to the edge of the motor housing, I managed to straighten that out. It, it was very flat on there and it was true to the uh, belt axis. So those two jobs have got out of the way and we've now got to this stage where we've got uh, a rolling rear axle. The next job is I need to make the diff cover plates and to do that I need to take all this apart. So for the differential cover plate what I decided to do I bought this um, aluminium tube so it's 63 millimeters in diameter outer diameter and the inner diameter is about 60 millimeters now it's not perfectly round so it's 60 plus or minus a tiny bit and the diameter of this is 60 millimeters as well so I'm going to take this unit off see what the fits like over there then the idea is that I'll cut an access window in this which lines up with that part there that allows me to assemble it and then I can uh, tighten the grub screws here uh, and lock that off and then I can rotate this cylinder so that, that window moves round to one of these areas and then lock it in position with the screws so it should be protected from the worst of the dust and stones that might go in there that's the plan anyway so we need to take the axle apart and get the diff off. Okay, let's see uh, how well it fits. perfect fit. I know these these tubes are not made absolutely perfectly to dimension and they're certainly not round. Okay so I might have to go to plan B. Okay having thought it through all the pros and cons of each possibility I think what I'm going to do is uh, I think what I'll do is um, cut a piece out like that that is just basically a hatch that goes on top of this side maybe put some flat form into it across here and then just drop that hatch on and bolt it in place there. What I can then do is slightly uh, squeeze it over centre so that it's got quite a nice grip on the tube all the way around. So what I don't want to do is, I mean it's not going around particularly fast, but I don't want these the unsupported edges to fly out at high speed like a sort of centrifugal clutch and suddenly catch on the frame and crash the whole rear differential. I don't think it'll do that, it's fairly thick and it's a fairly short piece and if I put a bit of preload on it will probably stay fairly well uh, connected to this. So there'll be one this side and then I'll make a duplicate one to go on the other side. So basically a pair of hatches to cover the diff. that probably make it a little bit easier to make and to assemble and get a nice fit. Right let's go and do that. Right, so we're over at the CNC machine now, so as you can see I've got the, the tube clamped in the vise and I've got the V-blocks at the back to give it some support and then I've got it against this datum here because that'll make it a little bit easier when we make the second one. 
And then I've just trammed the voice in using the DTI there across the back there, so that's nice and level. And then the last thing to do is to make sure this was correct in a rotational sense. So this is one edge of the plate, and then the other edge of the plate's here. So what I've done is I zeroed off the top, went down the 10 millimeters, and made sure that that line lined up with the pointer on this side, and then went around the other side, made sure it, the pointer lined up with the line on that side, and just kept adjusting it until I got it so these were even. Right, let's get going. Here's the finished hatch with the holes drilled, just cleaned up all the edges and here's the one for the other side, so let's just see how it fits. Looks okay. So you can see there's that little flap there which I originally machined to take a larger bolt. Um, so what I'm going to do is just locally press the plate here and here. I've got to watch out for, I've got to watch out that this doesn't flare out too much. I've got to be careful how I do that. That looks okay. Now, uh, one thing you'll notice is that these holes are quite small and it's because originally uh, there's an M5 tapped hole there and because I remachined the pulley or redesigned the pulley to be offset, uh, I didn't really check the bolt clearances so uh, you can see it's it's too close there so I've gone with three millimeter holes and these will be M3 now clearly you can't put an M3 bolt into an, uh, an M5 hole so what I've done is just machined four little inserts on the lathe uh, just took an aluminium bar tapped M5 down the outside drilled up the center and tapped that uh, M3 and then just parted them off and just cut a little slot head uh, in the top and here's an example here So basically it's uh, an M5 to M3 adapter with a little slot cut in the top and that will go I'll go in here and we'll just uh, permanently Loctite that in. So I'm using the green Loctite for this so it should be fairly secure. Just uh, let that wick down the threads. Yeah, you can see it's light green all the way around now. one done looks okay so we'll do the other three and then we'll bring you back okay so I've got all four done you can see four threads so let's see if the cover goes on so I've just wrapped some masking tape around it and then I'm going to take screw out at one end and then 
we'll just squeeze that together in the vise. It might lift these edges up, we'll, well, we'll see how we get on. Okay, I've just been uh, bending it slightly in the vise, so we've got the two flats now, and then we just brought that curve around a little bit, so let's just try it out. It goes uh, that way. Right, let's get the rest together. seems to work quite nicely it's fairly smooth so I think um, I'm just gonna lock tight this little grub screw here that holds that shaft in because if that comes loose it will hit this and lock up pretty quickly uh, I don't want to lose that grub screw anyway uh, the other ones I think I'll leave um, until it's had a bit of a dry run because I'm sure I'll come back and disassemble and just have a look and see how the gears are I'll probably want to get in here anyway just for the first run just put a dab of grease on there um, right, let's lock tight that in place. I'll just put some blue lock tight on this one because I'm sure it might be coming off in the future. So I bought this off eBay quite a while ago, and in the picture 
on the eBay advert it did have Loctite and a genuine sticker or label uh, but what they sent me was locked to whatever uh, so a casual glance it does look like Loctite but clearly isn't so I complained to the seller they gave me my money back I have been using it ever since and it does work fine it does feel a little bit watered down maybe if I'm um, comparing to the genuine stuff but still locks uh, threads in place so I'm going to keep using it uh, it's pretty cheap so maybe that's the giveaway anyway watch out for that if you see uh, something very similar to Loctite on eBay right let's get this one locked in place I'll just let that dry. That's the rear axle complete. Okay, we're just going to check the run out just out of interest. So I've got it right on the end of the axle here. So we've got it zero. Each increment is 0 0.01 millimeters, so a hundredth of a millimeter. So it looks like about 0 0.0. .0 five that's pretty good um, it would be more concentric than that um, off the lathe because this is measured um, this is machined all in one go should be within 0 0.01 maybe 0 0.02 at worst probably better than that so maybe it's just due to these bearings pretty inexpensive but yeah but uh, it's not really going to cause any uh, wobbling and balance issues at that kind of run out and the speeds this is going to run. Yeah, it's moving around a little bit. Yeah, let's call it about 0.05. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about wheels. So these are the wheels I'm going to use for this cart. I've got a pair of these off eBay for about £15. It's pretty cheap. Uh, they're intended to use on sack trucks, so the axle go in here and here on these bearings and then you just put a nut on the back and they just freewheel on the axle but of course we don't want to freewheel we want to be able to drive them so I'll be driving them through these four holes so this has basically got to come off uh, but the way they're made is the back of this tube is peened over onto this to to hold the whole assembly together so I need to disassemble this well first of all I need to um, take some of the air out and then disassemble this because when I take these four nuts off they're essentially holding the tire on as well and if there's high pressure inside the tire these little rivets uh, aren't enough to hold the thing together and it tends to just spring apart uh, ask me how I know that uh, so what we need to do is strip this down get this uh, hub and plate on the lathe and turn that piece off and then that will free this part and then we'll be left with the piece we need let's go and do that now So the first plate is pretty straightforward. Now you can see the uh, inner tube inside and the other plate, the back of the bearing. So here's the other side. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now you can see the, the bearing tube and on this side where they've peened it over so we need to machine this back to, to relieve this and this part here and then we won't need this tube anymore
So I've got the wheel loosely on the hub. I'm just reusing the original hardware, but just not putting the nuts on the back. And we're just going straight into the M8 holes in the hub. But now you can see how it's made. So the, the outer part, and then the one on the other side, hold the tire and the inner tube together. And they're also what hold it onto there. So every time you take this off, the whole thing wants to come apart. You have to um, let the air pressure out. I don't know how often I'm going to be doing that. If I do that, I'll probably make something so that it holds the wheel in place with two very small nuts and bolts. And then you can take the wheel on and off without the whole thing um, kind of trying to explode on you. Uh, there's also nothing to center the wheel. And I did think about uh, machining a recess in the drive flange so that this cuts out on the other side uh, would, would centralize it. But I wasn't really sure how round that was compared to this. So I thought, well, what I'll do, I'll just roughly offer it up, spin it up, and just see what the balance is like and see what the runout's like. And maybe just do it by eye. It might be close enough. Uh, let's basically just see what we get first before we start getting too complicated. out this way well nothing's very accurate on these things are they let's just put it together and just uh, see what it's like when it's actually going otherwise I end up making my own wheels and I'm not sure we want to go that far So it looks like on the other side, you can see those M8 screws have just come nicely through and they're flush with the drive plate. Looks like it was made for the job. Alright, happy with that. Okay, we'll spun the cart round and we'll get the other one on. As you can see, it can be a bit fiddly to get three plates lined up and then line them up with a the hole. So you wouldn't want to be taking the wheels on and off regularly. A bit easier once you've got the first two in because everything then lines up. Alright, let's put it on its wheels for the first time. Also give me a chance to see how heavy this is getting. Yeah, not too bad. Okay, so what we've got on the front panel, we've obviously got the on off switch here. Uh, we've got the voltage adjustment and the current adjustment. Now, this model is a little bit more expensive than some of the other models because um, it's also got the fine voltage setting there and the fine 
a setting there for current. It's also got, which I thought would be very handy, um, I'm always charging up my phone in the garage because um, I use my phone for filming. So it's got um, a USB charge socket down there, which I think would be very useful, so we'll try that out as well. Um, it's got uh, the usual protective film over there. It looks like it's scratched, but it's just the protective film, so we'll leave that on for now. Uh, the unit itself is fairly weighty, but nothing too excessive. Around the back, they've got the usual suspects. So we've got the fan here to keep it cool, the IEC connector there, and then our switch here. So we're 220 volts in the UK, the other one will be 110. Uh, speaking of the power supply, let me just show you the lead that we got sent. So the cable that came with it um, had the uh, EU style plug on the end, which isn't any good in this country. Um, I did know they were going to send this because they didn't have the UK plug in stock and I said well, I'll just send it anyway um, because I'll replace this with the UK plug. Uh, they did actually also send uh, this travel adapter as well, uh, which would plug into there, Oh, he says, yeah there we go plug into there and would in theory allow you to plug it into the UK but there's no fuse in here and there's no fuse in here so I prefer not to use that but that's what they sent anyway but you can get this with a UK style plug they just haven't they didn't have any in stock so I said I'll just send it anyway because uh, I've got quite a few of these kicking around so you got your IEC connector there to UK, UK style plug there and it's got the fuse in there. I think there's a 3 amp fuse in this, which would be plenty. Right, let's plug it in and see what we got. And here are the destructions. So the model I've gone for here is the 310, which is up to 30 volts and 10 amps. The reason I went for that is because I need 24 volts to run the cart, and I thought a 10 amp overhead would give me enough, just in case I need a little bit more current. The other ones of the higher voltage, 64 and 100, would have meant dropping down on the current, uh, so I didn't think they would be quite so useful. So I went for the 310 model, that's what we've got here. Uh, what else is interesting? Um, yeah, okay. Right, let's dive in. Okay, so we got our volts shown at the top, currently set to about 22 drawing no current and we've got power at the bottom in watts. Right, well, let's have a fiddle around with these controls then. So on the course, so it looks like we're clamping that voltage down. Uh, okay, we can go a little over 32. All the way down two and a half, maybe the fine will drop us down. Pretty much zero. So on the display, zero to 30 volts is showing. So let's set that to 24. Sure, we'll be running the motor at. Close to. Okay, that'll be fine. Right, so the first thing we'll do when we're playing around with this, we're going to try out the USB uh, port down there. So I've got a pretty old iPhone 5. I haven't used for some time, so it's probably completely flat. So we'll put that in there, plug it in, and see what happens. Okay, I just recognised it, so that's a good start. We couldn't do too much more here, so time to head out to the workshop. See you there. So the other thing that Banggood sent was this set of five connecting cables, or test cables. So you've got uh, crocodile clips or alligator clips on one end, like that. And then on the other end you've got um, banana plugs, and you can uh, stack them. So you can put multiple ones in there and make multiple connections, it's very handy. So a set of five in here, it's fairly inexpensive. Um, so if you do ever do buy a power supply like that and you haven't got any cables, it's worth having a look at those as well. So the first thing we're going to do is just test the accuracy of the voltage on there. Uh, so I borrowed this uh, Fluke multimeter. This is uh, sent away for calibration every year, so it's fairly accurate. Okay, so we've got the multimeter hooked up. 
let's try 5 volts that's something you typically might use uh, for a small electronic component or for a small device so let's go to 5 just try and get there with the, with the uh, course Okay, so reading 5 volts on there and 4.99 on there. Yeah, pretty happy with that. Okay, so another common voltage might be 12 volts. Well, let's see if we can get there on the fine. Oh, I haven't left myself any. Let's go over a little bit. Okay, 12. 11.97 so they're reading oh, uh, 24 23.94 so a little under but uh, still very close and still perfectly usable for the workshop right let's do two more tests one is um, let's just find out how much range we've got on the fine so we're currently on okay so if we wind that down to minimum and wind this to say 24 well, as best we can get on the course one more okay mm. Go on. okay so we, all right let's leave it there so we're on minimum here let's just spin that all the way around Okay, so we have two volts of adjustment on the fine. I guess one more thing we can try is, well, some of these um, power supplies don't have the fine for the voltage and fine just for the current. So let's just see how easy it is to get to somewhere just using the core. So we'll just put that somewhere randomly in the middle. Uh, let's just head for 20 volts just on the course. As the na name suggests, it's fairly coarse. I guess if you're patient, you can get there. Down a bit, down a bit. Okay, let's just tr okay. And how easy it to get there? How easy it to get there on the? Uh, if I just use the fine, then so let's just put that somewhere random, right? Let's say I was just trying to dial it in on the fine. Yeah, you can feel that's uh, giving you a lot more control. There we are. So I guess you are paying more if you want the fine adjust. You'll have to decide how accurately you want that and how much um, effort you want to go to on the course adjust. Um, so if you, if you need very accurate voltages or you play around with those a lot, then the fine is certainly worth having on those. All right, something else I thought was worth trying is, um, so on CNC machines, you want to uh, you often want to set those up without having to put absolutely everything together as you're building it and making sure things are working. And a thought did occur to me that, um, so we do use these uh, proximity sensors for limits and end stops and so on. You probably saw that in one of the earlier videos. Here's one that I put together while I was building that machine and um, I thought it wasn't working, so I labeled it up. Um, then I discovered that there was another problem in the system and I fixed that, um, but by then I'd swapped this out. So I don't actually know if this, you can see it's been uh, been well used. So it'd be quite interesting to see. Yeah, let's just hook it up to that and just see if it really is working or it really is um, beyond repair. So let's just hook that up. Let's see if it really is uh, broken. Where's the LED out there? Ah. I think I can remove that label. The sensor was fine after all. Another thing you could do with a power supply is if you've got um, a CNC machine you're building and you just want to test a motor that's arrived together with uh, the stepper driver. So you just put the power in there from the power supply. The motor would connect into the A's and B terminals and then you'd put a series of pulses in through a function generator if you put 5 volts into the direction signal or the direction input that will just change the direction and you could either check the motor out or check an axis out before you before you've got a full control box working 
So I just made up this connector here. Made the ring connectors and we can just try it on there. Um, I did draw this out just a few minutes ago and it ran backwards on the motor, which is no big deal, I'll just need to swap these over. But just for this trial then, I'll actually connect this to the positive and this to negative so it uh, turns in the other direction. This is just a DC motor on here, so to change direction you just swap the wires over. So let's set that up. Um, these tyres still haven't got any air in, so they're probably just going to be wobbling all over the place. What I really just want to do is just have a listen to it and just make sure it sounds smooth, make sure the belt's not going to wander. Um, we won't be able to run it up to full speed, I'm pretty sure of that, because I think it will just vibrate and shake around. It's only balanced on a block underneath, just so that we raised it off the bench. I don't want it shooting off the bench. So it's more of a kind of functional check, make sure everything's good. So let's increase the voltage, um, see what happens. So run it nearly 10 volts, just pulling one and a half amps. It is shaking around a bit because uh, these tires are not particularly round, certainly when they're not got any air in them. But yeah, it sounds quite nice. It's running okay. So that seems to work quite nicely. The motor was quite smooth, the belt tracked quite nicely. Um, it sounded good. Uh, clearly we can't run from the mains power supply when we're out and about. So in the next episode we'll have a look at getting the batteries mounted. I need to make a battery box and they will sit here. Be one there and one ahead of it. So I need to get that sorted out. And we'll also have a look at the brake calipers and getting those mounted up as well. Okay, so summing up this power supply, this particular power supply is about £70. They do make cheaper and sell cheaper power supplies than this, but they don't necessarily come with the fine tuning for the voltage or the current, and they don't have the USB charging function, and they don't have the 10 amp capability. They're typically a lot less. So it depends on what you might need for your workshop. You can certainly buy something a lot cheaper in the range, or, or if you do need the fine tuning, the USB feature and the high current, there's this model to think about as well. It is a review product, so if you click on it, I do get a small commission. All right, see you in the next one.